Good evening, everyone. It is Friday, and we are studying Daniel. We are now, I think, in week six, and we are still in this global pandemic, as you know. So uh, we continue to pray for everyone. Um, it's getting really tough out there with all of the um, struggles that everyone's going through, financial and with the family. And, and um, But we're coming to the summer. Maybe this thing will start to slow down. And we see that governments and states are starting to lift their restrictions. So we're going to keep that in prayer over the next uh, four weeks here. But um, in the meantime, I like to go ahead and let's just get started. Let's start with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just want to pray now for your Holy Spirit. Give us guidance as we study the book of Daniel and the prophecies that you have for us there. Help us to find relevance and application for us as we definitely approach these last days. Father, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, again, welcome everybody. Tonight we're going to be looking at conflict results in conversion. So let's go ahead and get right into it with a quiz. Uh, this is from last week. So let's start first with this question one. Daniel 3 is a nice bedtime story to tell to children, but it has no meaning for Christians today. Is that true or false? Question two. The only way that a person can stand firm and true to God in the final crisis is to have a solid relationship with Jesus Christ right now. Okay, is that true or false? All right, question three. When Nebuchadnezzar offered to the three Hebrews a second chance, they asked for extra time to think it over. What do you think? Is that true or false? Okay, question four. While God does not always deliver his people from trials, he always goes through the trials with them. True or false? Okay, and then question five. Revelation 13 indicates that the issues of the last days will be the same as Daniel's days. In other words, the issue of worship and obedience. Okay, let's take a look at the answers. So question number one. Daniel 3 is a nice bedtime story to tell to children, but it has no meaning for Christians today. And the answer to that is false. As you remember, a lot of the narratives in the book of Daniel are actually prophetic. In other words, God gave us those stories to let us know in the last days the same kind of issues and events that would confront God's people right before the second coming. Okay, question two. The only way that a person can stand firm and true to God in the final crisis so we're talking about the final crisis is to have that solid relationship with Jesus Christ right now. And I think you know the answer to that is true. Definitely. If you can't handle the small stuff now, how are you going to handle the big stuff later, right? Okay, question three. When Nebuchadnezzar offered to the three Hebrews a second chance, they asked for extra time to think it over. And the answer to that is false. These three Hebrews, they didn't have to think it over. They were already solid in their mind how they were going to answer in spite of facing death. So the question is, Is are you and I ready to be that confident um, when we're confronting death? Okay, question four. While God does not always deliver his people from trials, he always goes through the trials with them. And that was the great message there we found in Daniel 3, is um, that a lot of times God's people will still go through that persecution and suffering, but God promises that he will be there with us through that time to protect us. Okay, and then question five, Revelation 13 indicates that the issues of the last day, so we're talking about right before the second coming of Jesus, that these will be the same in Daniel's day, the same issues of worship and obedience. And the answer to that question is absolutely true, true. So the same thing that we saw in Daniel 13 will be what we're confronting in the last days, and it's prophesied in Revelation 13. Okay, here's a universal truth. The only people who will overcome in the final days, so we're talking about you and me, the only ones who can overcome in these final days are those who are developing a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ right now. All right, so that is a universal truth. Okay, let's go ahead and let's get started um, into our study here. Let's take a look at another one of King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams that he had. And we start in Daniel chapter 4. So who is the author of Daniel 4? So what's interesting, as you can see from my picture here, it starts off, Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell 
in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. So here we see that this is one of the few books of the Bible that has a um, a converted pagan heathen king um, writing um, a chapter in the Bible. And uh, as you know, Nebuchadnezzar was the great king of Babylon. And um, we're going to discover here that he goes through this transformation. And at the end of his life, King Nebuchadnezzar ends up becoming one of God's people. So when we get to heaven, we'll probably have a chance to meet King Nebuchadnezzar um, face to face. So what did Nebuchadnezzar hope to reveal through his testimony? So as you take a look in that same chapter of four, uh, Daniel 4, in verse 2 or 3, he had a specific purpose in mind. So there we see that King Nebuchadnezzar um, wanted to make sure that um, everyone on the planet knew that signs and wonders came from the Most High God and were directed towards him. Who did Nebuchadnezzar call in when he had this dream this time? So again, you remember in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter... Um, uh, later on, we're going to discover in, in um, this chapter here, but in others, when kings um, have these dreams, they normally call in all of these um, heathen, pagan soothsayers, wise men, astrologers, magicians. Well, we see that same thing happening here in Daniel chapter 4. When King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, he calls in all the wise men of Babylon, which would include all of these magicians and soothsayers, those who dealt in the occult and black magic. Um, but could the wise men interpret that dream? So you remember in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar actually forgot the dream. And he asked the wise men to tell him not only what he dreamed, but also what the interpretation was. Now, here in Daniel chapter 4, we see an evolution. Here, King Nebuchadnezzar remembers his dream, and he asks his wise men to interpret the dream. So could they? And the answer is no, they could not interpret it. So even when they were told the dream, they the wise men knew that King Nebuchadnezzar was more savvy and more knowledgeable because he just came through that golden image experience where he praised God. He, he just came through the experience with Daniel when he had the uh, dream of the images. So um, they knew they couldn't create a false interpretation this time to put um, pull wool over the king's eyes. So when the king asked, could you interpret? No, none of them could interpret it. Um, now, there's a, there's a point here that I want to bring out. And you'll really see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 6. And that is that whenever God needs us to learn something, typically what he does is he will discredit all of the quote-unquote wise men. So for us today, that might include um, palm readers, astrologers, horoscopes, even the, the wise men today we would consider would be the professional experts in, in all of the sciences and all of the different areas of, of study, right? Um, if God is going to do something and he says it, he will make sure that it happens in spite of what all the wise men have to say. So who does Nebuchadnezzar now, because these others could not interpret the dream, who does he call in? So you remember, he remembers that Daniel was able to um, interpret all these dreams. So he brings in Daniel. So what were um, details regarding the vision that Nebuchadnezzar related to Daniel in Daniel chapter 4? So as you look at verse 10 through 18, King Nebuchadnezzar begins to have this dream. And so you can take time to read this. If you haven't already um, read this in Daniel chapter 4, I want you to, um, you can go back in Daniel chapter 4, verse 10 through 18. And of course, you can always go back and review these um, these videos um, that are being posted to the YouTube site. And um, you can go back and look at these texts here. But in that dream, here are some of the details regarding that vision. First of all, he saw a tree whose height was very great. It was a gigantic tree where all eyes can see it from distances. Two, the tree um, was not a weak tree. It grew and it was very strong. The height reached unto heaven and the, um, everyone from the ends of the earth could actually see it. The third aspect was the tree was to be cut. In other words, it was hewn down. So this great, mighty, strong tree that everyone can see that grew up into heaven was cut or hewn down. The fourth aspect of that dream was that um, 
but the stump so the stump was left so leave the stump with a band of iron and brass around it so it was very unusual during there so the tree was cut down the stump was left uh, with an iron um, and brass band wrapped around it okay then the stump was to be wet with the dew of heaven in other words it was still being fed with this dew from heaven then we notice that um, the dream went on and said, let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. So now it, it redirects from this tree and the stump with the band and it's being watered. Now it, it, it switches and says, let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. So you see that the focus uh, changes from this tree and directs it to an individual where he will spend his time with the beast of the field eating grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast heart be given unto him. So there's this, this um, horrible thing that happens to this person where he goes from having a man's heart to a beast heart. And that would last till seven times or seven years passes over him. So whenever we talk about times, a time is one year. When they say times, it's multiple. So seven times is seven years. Okay, so what was the purpose of the dream? So remember, King Nebuchadnezzar is the one writing it. So he's telling you about this dream he had. He calls in Daniel. And again, so in this letter, this decree that King Nebuchadnezzar is giving to the entire world, what purpose um, did he have of the dream? That the living may know. So that's for you and I. Even, and remember, Daniel is a prophetic book that points us to the last days, as you will discover that this is actually related to many of the um, books in the New Testament, especially the book of Revelation. So here, King Nebuchadnezzar says that the purpose of this dream was to let the living know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he will. So that's really... Um, a message of hope, particularly right now when you see all these nations and all these leaders in conflict and it seems like our leaders have no idea what they're doing. They can't get their arms wrapped around things. And and here Nebuchadnezzar is delivering a message from God saying that, don't worry, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he will. So God is still in control. Okay, so let's take a look at Daniel's interpretation. So how did Daniel respond when he heard the dream? So King Nebuchadnezzar gives Daniel this, this message and Daniel has a very clear response. He says in, the, um, in, in that chapter that Daniel was astonished for one hour. In other words, it surprised him. It shocked him. He sat there like he couldn't believe it. He understood what the dream meant, but, he, but Daniel knew that it was a, a, a particular message that was not a good message that he would have to deliver to King Nebuchadnezzar. You remember Nebuchadnezzar had this propensity to kill everyone that he he um, he confronted. So maybe Daniel was deliberating in his mind, uh, wow, this is a horrible dream. I'm going to have to deliver it to King Nebuchadnezzar. There's another aspect that God gave that, that dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. There's a third aspect that God loves King Nebuchadnezzar so much that that there's a purpose for King Nebuchadnezzar for, for future generations. So Daniel is sitting there astonished, and he was astonished for an entire hour. He just sat there. Can you imagine Daniel just sitting there shaking his head saying, man, I can't believe this dream. This is crazy. How am I going to tell Nebuchadnezzar? Okay, so who did Daniel say the tree represented? So here we reveal the interpretation. So as you progress through Daniel chapter 4, when we get to chapter 20 and verse 22, we are told that the tree is actually symbolic of King Nebuchadnezzar himself. So God gave King Nebuchadnezzar this dream. And Daniel says, King, you are actually that tree. God raised you up strong. Your influence reaches to heaven. You, your branches um, overflow. Um, all nations and beasts come and they, they hide under the shadow of the protection and the sustenance that God has given you. And you are that tree. Okay, so what was to happen to Nebuchadnezzar? So there we see that in this um, dream, God told Nebuchadnezzar that he will be cut down. So in other words, um, now this is not when Medo-Persia was about to take over. This is happening during King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. 
So Nebuchadnezzar is this king, this mighty king of Babylon. He's had two significant encounters with God, with the dream of the statue and then with the golden image with the three Hebrews. And now he's given another dream and um, it's, God is telling him that he will be cut down for seven years, but um, he will have the promise that God will still watch over him and his kingdom during this period of time. Okay, so what was to happen to Nebuchadnezzar during those seven years? They will drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with beasts of the field. So Daniel saying, God is going to change your heart from a, a man's heart to a beast heart, and you will be driven from men and dwell, and you will eat grass wet with the dew of heaven. So he's going to go through this insanity process because of his pride, his arrogance, not giving glory to God. So what did God hope Nebuchadnezzar would learn through that experience of insanity? That the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and giveth to whomsoever he will. Because remember, at this point, King Nebuchadnezzar believed that he was the one who was, was responsible for building this tremendous kingdom, the um, one of the um, great seven wonders of the ancient world was actually built by King Nebuchadnezzar, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And there we see that Nebuchadnezzar, even on the archaeologists found ta um, little clay tablets of bricks that had Nebuchadnezzar's stamp on there saying, Babylon is mine, I, I built it. And so he, he was very arrogant, very prideful. He took all the glory. But here we see that God is saying, no, the most high rules and that the kingdom was given to you. So... Was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom to be sure during that period of insanity? So while God was trying to teach Nebuchadnezzar, the question was, was Nebuchadnezzar going to be able to retain his kingdom or, or was it going to be weak during that process? And God gave um, Nebuchadnezzar some hope. Um, in verse 26, he was set, uh, God told him that the kingdom will be sure. In other words, it will be safe from the attack of any marauders or any other kingdoms. God wanted to work with Nebuchadnezzar and put him through this trial period. But during that trial period, God would protect him and all of his belongings, his influence, his, his, um, his progeny, everything that God gave him, God will protect. And that's a good message for you and me because sometimes when we go through trials and tribulations, um, we're fearful because we're afraid that we're going to lose things or that um, we'll never recover. And if God is responsible for the trial, just remember that God not only promises a better life after that, but he will protect everything that he established for you before that time. So here we see this map where the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar will be sure. In other words, there will be no changes during that seven-year period while King Nebuchadnezzar is drawing closer to God through this trial. So what counsel did Daniel give to Nebuchadnezzar? So we see Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. Daniel gives this horrible interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar, you could just imagine, is like, oh, you know, like this. I don't believe it, you know. And But what counsel did Daniel give to Nebuchadnezzar? In other words, there was a way, it was conditional. There was a way for Nebuchadnezzar to avoid that prophecy. And so Daniel gives it to him and says, Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. So Clearly, um, Nebuchadnezzar had an issue, and um, he, he had an issue of sin, just like you and I. Um, he had an issue of wickedness, like you and I, um, and he had a lot of iniquity. And the iniquity specifically here was um, by lifting himself and the rich and suppressing and oppressing the poor. So um, the same things that we see today in, tw in the 21st century where we see the, the uplifting of the rich and the oppression of the poor and separating out a small, thin middle class, it's exactly the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar was dealing with over 2,600 years ago in the kingdom of Babylon. So Daniel says, if you want to avoid this horrible prophecy regarding you and the kingdom, Daniel says you can avoid it by meeting these conditions. Break off your sins. In other words, repent and confess. Now, for a king that represents the entire kingdom, it was very specific. Here's what you need to do. You have to work your way towards righteous policies. Work your way towards righteous judgment. When you rule and when you dictate, make sure that it's based on righteousness. And notice that the conditions for that righteousness 
and um, overcoming those iniquities is by showing mercy to the poor. In other words, you were given this great influence. God has blessed you with cultivation. You have irrigation. You have two mighty rivers. Uh, you have um, power. You have the most awesome uh, military force in the world. You have um, food of plenty, and yet you have poor. This is not a country that should be experiencing poor, and you should be able to receive those from around the surrounding countries to receive all of these blessings. And yet Nebuchadnezzar was very much into himself and closing off his borders and saying, this is just about me and what we built together in Babylon. And Daniel says, remember that you are this great tree that God blessed you with where you have influences over the entire world and you have to show mercy to the poor among all. So um, that was the condition that Daniel gave to Nebuchadnezzar. And I believe this is same, the same issue that we see here in Daniel 4 is the same issue that we see in governments today. God said that there will come a time in the future when you will have governments who are more focused on their own, um, their own selfish pride, their own arrogance, breaking off um, their influences of the world, even though God blessed them with so much. And we see the, that even happening in the United States in this pandemic. You heard that Tyson is destroying chickens. You heard that farmers are destroying millions of dollars of crops. Um, rather than giving that to the poor and those who are starving right now because of this pandemic, they're destroying all of that and they were closing off borders um, because our focus is just on ourselves. And here we see the same thing that happened, that's happening now happened to King Nebuchadnezzar in the past. So here's a fact. Prophecies concerning individuals are conditional. Okay, In Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10, God says, and you can read that, that if he adds a promise, he will fulfill the promise as long as you meet certain conditions um, and you will receive the benefits. If he promises good, but you turn and do iniquity, then God will break off those um, blessings and um, will bring down tests and trials to bring you back in line there. Okay, so prophecies concerning individuals and nations are conditional. Okay, so let's take a look a little bit more into Nebuchadnezzar's insanity and his ultimate reformation, his ultimate conversion back to God. So what happened to Nebuchadnezzar one year later? So as you know, you can read in Daniel chapter 4, verse 28 to to 38, 33, these uh, words that Nebuchadnezzar happened to be wandering out on his balcony and he was looking at the hanging gardens and the waterfalls and the, the amazing power he had. And he sat there and he looked at it and said, wow, look at what I did. This is me, me, me. And in that same hour, the voice came down from heaven that that prophecy would be fulfilled that same hour. So what happened? Um, Nebuchadnezzar was stricken and um, he um, went insane and uh, he was in the field for seven years and uh, he was eating like a cow and um, um, after he came to his senses, um, he started to bless God. Who did Nebuchadnezzar bless when his sanity returned after that seven years? The Most High God. So he could have avoided that entire seven year trial if he would have just acknowledged when the prophecy was given to him that God was in control, it, it, that would have been a perfect time for Nebuchadnezzar to make the turnaround in Babylon um, and try to be the blessing that he was meant to be. But no, he went and fulfilled that prophecy and um, he ended up um, going into the beast, uh, turning to a beast like a beast, going into the field. And then only after the seven years did he bless the Most High. So what are the last words of Nebuchadnezzar's testimony? So as we come to the close in Daniel chapter 4 and we look at verses 35 through 37, look at these last words. I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. So right there, man, there is no better person praising God than King Nebuchadnezzar at this point. And he, he actually does a better job than some of us today, right? And then he goes on and says, all whose works are truth. You know, today there's so many people who don't even believe in God. There are many people today who claim their own works as being their own glory. Here, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, God's works is truth and God's ways are judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. 
So here you see that of all the sins that God um, really focuses on, the one thing that God really dislikes is pride. You know, God can forgive anything. He can even forgive pride. But pride is the number one thing that brings people down. And it takes a long time for people to overcome themselves. They have to realize through lots of trial, lots of um, tribulation, that God is in control, that God is the giver of all wisdom and knowledge and success. And it's very difficult in our day because we go to school and we feel like we've earned our own degrees, that um, the opportunities that we have, we put those on our own resume. And so it's easy nowadays to like lift ourselves up. But we have to remember that our knowledge, our skill, our opportunities, anything that you see on your resume, there is something that God um, created that allowed you to get to that point. It might have been a person who helped you through school, or it might have been a, a father or mother who encouraged you, or, or an uncle and aunt who maybe um, supported you through that time, or maybe it could have been friends or a teacher um, that said, don't quit now, just keep going. And that was God working through these individuals to get you where God needed you to be because God had a purpose for you. But so oftentimes when God, when we get to that purpose where God wants us, we find success. So we, it's easy for us to focus on ourselves and forgetting that it was God who needed us there for a particular reason. And this is true in every field. It can go from um, government, politics, to medical, to the legal field, to even the pastoral ministry field. Any field that you might find yourself in, it could be in the services um, arena or in product developments or in biotechnologies. You know, none of that came by accident. Um, that that um, Those ideas that may have come up were given by God. Um, the technologies that you're learning and the things that you're designing may have come from God. And so here, um, Nebuchadnezzar wants us to know in a time when knowledge is increasing, that all of these things are gifts from God and that not to bring ourselves up to a point where we're prideful and we're arrogant because God will have to bring us down because he loves us. Okay, so how God saves people today is exactly the same. So take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. How does God save people today? It's the same thing. By grace, you are saved through faith, not of work. So it's not by what you did. It's not by what we accomplished, just like Nebuchadnezzar, but it's through the faith of what God is doing, lest any man should what? Boast. So there's no, there's no place for us to boast because it all comes from God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Apostle Paul calls salvation something really interesting. You know this, it's a gift of God. In other words, when you receive a gift, this last week I, um, I had a birthday and, um, you know, I was able to get some really awesome things uh, from my wife and my family. I didn't do anything to receive, to earn those gifts. That was given as love, from love, from the place of the heart of my wife and my family. So likewise, salvation is given not because you've done anything to earn it, but because God loved you so much that he gave it to you as a gift. That's how salvation comes to you and I. So we read in Acts chapter 16, um, what we must do, what must a person do then to accept that free gift of eternal life offered by Jesus Christ? If we're not earning it, like Nebuchadnezzar didn't build it or he didn't earn it himself, if we attain salvation and we didn't do anything, then what do we need to do then to accept it? And you know, it's super easy. Just believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So when even during this trials and persecutions, um, God will bring us to a point where he wants to say, I need, I, I love you so much. I want you to turn to me. I want to bless you some more. You didn't do anything to earn anything that you got. Just realize that God gave that to you and, all, and it's a gift. Believe on Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, let's take a look at the gospel and how that parses out. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, what does it say? Believe. Whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. And then you see it again in Mark chapter 5, verse 36. Uh, the same concept that the, the gospel, the good news for salvation is that you only have to believe. So I put up here a little graph that says 50%. So 50% is your part believing okay now take a look at the other 50 percent so we learned from nebuchadnezzar an important thing that faith without works is dead in other words you need to exercise that faith 
And exercising our faith is like exercising our body. Like God gave us our bodies, but our bodies will deteriorate if we don't exercise and do something with it to build it up. Same thing with our emotions and our spiritual life and our our mental capacity. God gave us brains, but if we don't exercise it and learn, then it starts to atrophy, really. So here we see that there's this concept in our um, um, spiritual life where we have to believe on Jesus. And then in Acts, in Hebrews, and Isaiah, you can go back and look at those texts. It says then that you take that faith and you learn more about God. You learn more about how to build a relationship with Jesus. You learn more on how to have that daily walk with God where he can continue to bless you and grow you and continue to prosper you. Um, And by following God and obeying what he's telling you, then that's the other 50%. So the good news is that it's a free gift. The good news, though, is that you can continue to prosper. You can continue to grow and continue to be strong by having a daily walk with the Lord. And that would be the other 50%. It's the exercise of those things that God has given you. You know, one of the things I like doing is archery. And um, I have this um, amazing archery set with arrows. You know, it's beautiful. It's a gift. It was given to me, but it doesn't do any good by looking at it hanging on my wall. I have to get good at at its usage. So I go out and I do target practice when I have time with my kids and we get better at it. So that would be that exercise of our faith. Obedience is that part of it. So to be complete, you need both. Okay, another universal truth. Is belief enough? So I know that there's some out there who are watching this saying, you know what, all you're saying is pretty good, but faith is all I need. I am saved by faith alone. Is belief enough? Okay, well, you see here in James chapter 2, verse 19, that the devil believes in God too. He was actually there with God. He knows that God exists, and he knows that God is love, and he know he knows that Jesus died for your sins. And guess what? Um, the, the devil, is he going to be saved because of those beliefs? The answer is is absolutely, unequivocally, a resounding no. Okay, so just because the devil believes, just like you and I, in fact, the devil probably believes even more in God, believes more in the in the faith of God, that's still not going to save the devil, right? So, three rules for Bible study. Faith and obedience are linked together. That's number one. Okay, so it's, it's, it's enough to have faith, but... After you have that faith, you have to exercise that faith to stay connected, okay? They are linked together. So when you read Romans and Acts and Hebrews, you begin to see that there is this balance between when you first discovered your justification, you have to remain sanctified by being obedient to the continual relationship that you're in with God. So God can continue to bless you and God can continue to prosper you. Now, I don't want to get legalistic here. I'm not saying that you have to do something in order to be blessed. Okay, what I'm saying is you're obedient because God is blessing you. Because God loved you first, then you are saying, yes, Lord, thank you so much. What do I, what do I need to do? It's very similar to your relationship with your own children or with your own father and mother. Okay, truth number two. God gives truths progressively. In other words, he doesn't put you from a dark room and then turn on these amazingly bright lights and say, okay, soak it all in. No, God gives truths over time. So that means that those of you who have been Christian for 10 years, you can't judge a person who just discovered the Lord just today and expect him to live to all the knowledge and truth and the growth that you experienced over the last 10 years. That's not fair because God gave you 10 years of progression in that relationship. You can't judge a person based on, on what you know. You can only, God can only judge a person what they know. You see that? Likewise, now there are many of you who are watching this who have been Christians and even deep knowledgeable in prophecies and God's laws and decrees and precepts and you've been in, in the church for 40 years Maybe you're born and you're generational Christian, okay? And maybe your grandfather or maybe your father 
um, were great missionaries or, or pastors, okay? And you have a lot of truth. And you look back on these people in the world and you say, oh, I can't, why are they wearing those earrings? Why do they put tattoos on? I can't believe they're drinking. Why are they smoking marijuana? Why are they um, that lifestyle? Why do they make a choice that's so against, you know, what I believe in the Bible? Okay, you can't judge these people based on what you, where God has taken you. Because God will judge you according to what you know and to the truth that, that God has given you. He's not going to judge that person based on your knowledge, okay? So God gives every person truth and it, it's progressive. So over, so you just have to love and accept everybody because remember, we're all in the same boat together. You can't judge anybody. So we have to be accountable for the truths that God has given us. But that accountability is not only for the truths that we were given. It's also accountability for truths that we could have taken and we were exposed to, but we rejected. So God would still hold us accountable for the truths that we could have learned, but we rejected that opportunity. Okay, number three. To understand the New Testament, we have to understand the Old Testament. Now, there's many... Um, in fact, there's a whole denomination today, and a lot of people believe this, that we're a New Testament church. In other words, we don't have to worry about anything in the Old Testament. Um, so even though the Old Testament may have been relevant, um, we don't have to worry about anything in the Old Testament because um, Jesus created a New Testament belief system that that's what we're accountable for. But I want to remind you that Jesus says that um, if you want to have a closer relationship with God and we want to understand who the Messiah is and understand salvation, we have to study the scriptures. And the scriptures that he was referring to, remember, the New Testament wasn't written yet. He's referring to the Old Testament. So the New and the Old Testament are actually the same. It's actually a balance. So where we might find um, the type or the example or the metaphor in the Old Testament, we discover the anti-type or the equivalent symbol of the truth of that symbol in the New Testament. So here's some examples. When you saw the sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament, that was symbolic of Christ. He would be sacrificed. Another example, when you saw Cyrus in the Old Testament mentioned, it's also symbolic of Christ. He's the anti-type. Literal Israel in the Old Testament is everything applying to spiritual Israel in the New Testament. So, and that's an important point for all of us because when we look at Israel, we think of all their feasts. We think about all of their... Um, their customs and, and when they prayed and, and the miracles that God showed them and how God responded to them, that is the same truth, the same God, the same examples, the same kinds of um, 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 deeper knowledge that we need to have today because what we're seeing in the Old Testament is still applicable here to spiritual Israel here in the last days. And finally, we're of course reading Daniel and uh, we're looking at Revelation when we look at literal Babylon, that is symbolic. It will discover even more in Revelation of spiritual Babylon. So we see that there is, um, to understand the New Testament, and in particular the Re in Revelation, it would be impossible to understand it unless you knew about the Old Testament. Okay, so let's take a look um, at this question here. There are four steps that people must take in coming to Jesus. So we kind of mentioned it and we kind of alluded to it in this discussion, but let's take a look at the first one. John 3.16, you know, is the start. You have to believe that God loves you, um, that there is a God and that he sent his only son. So step one is believe. Okay, step two, let the Holy Spirit lead you to that repentance. Here we see in the book of Acts chapter 11, when Peter was preaching and the apostles were preaching, um, and even when even when Saul turned to Paul and he was preaching, there was this there was this concept where they would preach and people would say, "Wow, okay, this is amazing. Jesus is God. I believe." But it never stopped there. You notice that there there was a response on behalf of the people. So what that what happened is the Holy Spirit led these individuals to a point of repentance a turning away, feeling sorry for hurting God, 
turning back to God. So that's what repentance means. It means turning away from the world, turning away from self and focusing it now on God, feeling bad for what you've done that hurt God because he really loves you and he wants to reach out for you. So I want you to notice the, the progression here. God's love came first, not repentance. So you don't repent to receive God's love. No, you receive God's love first. And because of that, it turns us and it leads us to repentance saying, wow, how can God love me after all I've done? Look at look at my horrible past. Look at my horrible present. And yet God still loves me. Okay, Lord, what do I need to do? So that, that point of turning back to God and focusing on God, all it takes is maybe a prayer. Just turning to God in a moment and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I deserve what I what I am going through, but I, I want to be forgiven. What can I do to make it right? That is repentance right there, right at that moment when you made that decision. So there's a third step, a confession. So right there, say, Lord, look at all that I've done in my life. I, I'm sorry for um, hurting myself, hurting my family, hurting my spouse, hurting my children, hurting society. I confess that individual specific precise sin. So you got to be specific. Now, many of us have so much that we have to just generally say, Lord, I, there's too much. It would take me forever. Conf I confess all of it and I turn it over to you. And that's still good. Um, but over time, God will start to work with you on those individual sins because because typically what we see in our lives are symptoms of something that digs deeper. So like, for example, if I'm, if I'm doing something that makes us feel shameful or guilty because of a propensity to do something like pornography or sexual immorality, it's never that as the, as the sin or iniquity that God is looking at. No, he's looking at more something that maybe in our heart we were injured. Maybe we were left alone and, we may, and maybe we were um, violated. And we turned at that moment away from God and we felt angry at God. So the anger and the turning away and the rebellion from God because of, of what we suffered when we were younger. So God is saying, I love you. I ha you know, I, I, I'm sorry for what happened to you. And um, there's still a hope and there's still a future and we can start this new. So at that moment, you repent to God, you confess and say, Lord, I'm sorry for being angry and rebellious. Um, I've made some horrible decisions that were out of my control and it caused me to do this, but I confess these specific things and um, thank you, Lord, for, for loving and forgiving me. Um, and at that point, that repentance and confession and that belief system, you're already going deep into that relationship with God where God will start to protect. God will start to um, give you strength to start to cut those things that are, are binding you and the chains that are binding you to whatever past that's that's holding you down, the past that Satan wants to oppress you with. Okay, then you come to that final step where you, you're at that point where you open the door and you're inviting Jesus into your heart and you're saying, Lord, I don't want you outside my life anymore. I want you in the temple. I want you in the household. You want I want you in my heart. And I want you to stay with me because I need your strength there. So the next time Satan comes knocking on the door, trying to bust the door down, guess who's going to answer the door? It won't be me. It's going to be you, Jesus. So there you open your heart's door and you invite Jesus in. And in Revelation 3.20, there um, you see the um, amazing metaphor where Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door, I will come in and sup with them. In other words, I will commune with him, have dinner with him, just be and have a life with that person. So faith or believing is the basis of all the action that we take. So um, hopefully you got that. So because of God's love um, and our faith in that love, all of a sudden we start to act. And it's not something that you think about. It's a natural thing that occurs because of that relationship. So never focus on the actions. Don't focus on the obedience part because you're missing something fundamental here. You're focusing on the on the do's and the don'ts rather than on the relationship. So it's very important that we learn this in the book of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar, he was taught that he needed to have a relationship with God. And because God worked with him and he he brought him through this experience, he realized that nothing that he that that he had belonged to him. He didn't do it. God can take it away. So he turned his attention back on God. He confessed. He repented. He believed. And because of that relationship that, that Nebuchadnezzar had with God, 
um, God prospered Nebuchadnezzar in the last of his life. So just like that, you and me, when people take these four steps, we invite Jesus into our lives, will our prayers be answered? And this is an amazing promise found in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It says, yes, whatever things, soever you desire, when you pray, okay? So if you desire, it's not only what you need. Because God knows what you need. You need a roof over your head. You need food on your table. You need health. You need medicines. You need to have those basic needs to keep you living. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Whatever you desire, not what you need. So in other words, the things that are on your heart that you really wish that you could have beyond your needs. When you pray specifically, accurately, and precisely on those things and you believe that you receive them. So... If, if you believe that you're going to receive them, guess what? You will have them. That's a promise that God gives you. You should try it out sometime. I've, I've done it so many times and God has always answered my prayers. Um, I'm so grateful to God. But you know what? Here's the thing. I don't pray for the things because I'm focused on the things. I normally pray on things because I needed to either spend time with my family, help me pr um, do the kinds of things I do as a pastor, um, it's always about God. It's never about me. So when our minds and hearts are turned towards God and we're doing God's will, God will start to bless us with those things that we desire because we're focusing it on God's will. And hopefully we have the time to receive all the blessings because maybe we won't have enough time to do all the things that God is blessing you with. So you get to it when you can and God understands that. But the main thing is, is God wants to see you happy and he wants to answer your prayers. That's a fact. Okay, will you pray the prayer of acceptance to follow and invite Jesus into your heart right now? That's a question I have for you. Um, and the reason for that is that I want you to receive that same peace that Nebuchadnezzar experienced, that same peace and the same answer to prayers that Jesus talked about in Mark. If you're willing to do that, just pray with me now this prayer of acceptance. Dear God, I recognize that I am a sinner. I have been trying to rule my own life, but I have failed miserably. I need Jesus Christ in my life. I know that you love me, that you have sent your son to die for me, and I invite you to come into my heart right now. Thank you for coming in. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. That's all you had to do. Now, let Jesus start to work with you. Think about your own life. God will start to bring to your mind those things that you might have felt guilty about or shameful about. Don't feel the guilt anymore. Don't feel the shame anymore. Just give those to God and say, Lord, here's where I'm at. And God will say, don't worry. Let's get that covered. Let's go deeper. And you'll begin to see that this prayer of acceptance will start to take um, hold. And because God is showing you love, then you'll, he'll continue to teach you things and you'll grow and grow in Christ. And as you learn those truths, Continue to obey, and your faith will continue to grow. All right. This is the reason why we do it. Jesus died on the cross. He's now interceding for you, and he's watching over you right now. But there's a time when God says that he is coming again, and I believe that time is very soon, and I want you to be able to be right with the Lord. So um, I want to continue to invite you to come back to these studies Invite your family and friends so that way they can learn some of the great things that you've learned here too. So here's some things that we are going to um, to look at. Now, what did we learn tonight's lesson? Trouble leads to conversion. Sometimes we go through trials, but it leads to our good and through a conversion. To overcome, we must have a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We've talked a lot about that. We too are like animals, right? Beasts in the heart. But when we come into conversion, God changes our hearts where we give glory and honor and praise to God rather than like animals thinking that it's all about us. Four, we are saved by grace alone, only through faith. And it's because of that faith and that relationship and that great gift that God gave us where obedience follows afterwards. So belief and obedience do go together. But remember, focus on the belief and the love first and the obedience follows. Okay, now... Knowing that, we're going to be taking a look at some subjects in the future. For example, are the Ten Commandments enforced today? Uh, many people say that the Ten Commandments are no longer binding. 
do we have to um, study those and should we be concerned about the Ten Commandments here in um, May of 2020? Okay, what happens when you die? There's been a ton of um, horrible things happening all over the world. Many storms in the Midwest. We're in a global pandemic. Um, Three million people infected with the coronavirus and we're, we're, um, the death toll is astronomical. What happens to those people when they actually die? And we're going to look at the biblical view of what happens when a person dies. Is baptism really required? So you heard about people who are being baptized. If so, how? Okay, is baptism required? If yes, if no, how? Okay, four, can we understand those funny beasts of Daniel and Revelation? We're going to start to dig in deep into those in the next coming weeks. What is the mark of the beast? There are many people who have been responding to me by writing me emails and sending me messages. Pastor Ed, are we seeing the mark of the beast right now? And they were giving me all kinds kinds of examples. So we're going to be talking about what is specifically the mark of the beast. And for that matter, is there an antichrist? And if there is an antichrist, who is it? Um, Some people have said it's Bill Gates. (laughs) Some others said it was Donald Trump. Um, Others said it was um, um, Putin. Okay, we're going to talk about the antichrist and who that person might be. Okay, then um, I've had this question come up. What happens during the millennium or what happens during the 1,000 years? So there is this concept of a future prophecy of a a millennium, a 1,000 years, where Satan is going to be dealt with. So we're going to be looking at that very specifically in the book of Revelation and how it relates back to Daniel. Okay, and then is heaven for real? Like we're talking about this, but um, I have a lot of listeners coming in from India and Bangladesh and Egypt. So welcome to all of you all who are, who are following me right now. And I've been getting this question a lot. Is there really a heaven or are we resurrected into a different heavenly spiritual realm? So we're going to be taking a look at what is heaven and is heaven actually for real? And then uh, we looked at this before, but we're going to look at it again. Why does God allow all the suffering? Um, because if God is really a God of love, why is he allowing all this stuff to happen? So we're going to be looking at that really specifically and parse out what the Bible says about it. All right, our next lesson next week is the fall of Babylon. Now remember, we're going to be looking at specifically uh, Daniel chapter 5 and King Belshazzar. So this is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He saw the handwriting on the wall and Babylon fell. But remember, that narrative, that story is really a symbol or a prophecy about our last days. And you should go to my YouTube site. I preached a sermon two weeks ago. Are we seeing handwriting on the wall today? Because that is a prophecy of the future. And I believe that we could be seeing the handwriting on the wall. So the fulfillment of that Daniel prophecy in Daniel 5, we could be seeing it right now in this pandemic. So you might want to go and check out my sermon. Are we seeing the handwriting on the wall? We're going to be talking about this next week as well. So until then, God bless everyone. Hopefully, um, you all have a good week, and um, I'll see you hopefully tomorrow, 3 o'clock. We will be studying the book of Revelation, and um, in the morning on Sundays, 9.30 and 11 o'clock, I'm doing a series called Messages from Jesus at 9.30, and then A New Day is Dawning, where I take a look at theology questions through the lens of prophecy um, and um, discuss kind of where we are in world history. So until then, God bless everyone. And um, I'm going to put up a text here. Hopefully everyone will remember and enjoy this as a promise. See, uh, see everyone later. Bye.